Thank you, Marisa. Thank you, Marisa. Just want to give a quick shout to the Linux Foundation. Always a pleasure to run webinars with, with you all. And always love the turnout and the engagement from the crowd that we end up having at these webinars. All right, without further ado, let me just welcome you guys again to our webinar today, all about five feature flag use cases you may not have thought of. For those of you who are more familiar with feature flags, there are probably a number of things that you're using feature flags for every day, which may in involve ops toggles, increasing velocity, doing more experiments with customers. But what about the things that might help you do things like get other teams on board, get someone else excited, maybe your boss, and, how, and also thinking about what are ways that you may be able to creatively use feature flags in your own applications and your services that may add more benefit to your applications, your business. So like Marisa said, uh, just a quick little bit about myself. I'm on the product marketing team here at Harness, been here about a year, uh, working on our feature flags product. And with me, I have Ethan Jones, the Director of Product Management for Harness Feature Flags. And I will be your MC today. Ethan will be the primary sharer and presenter and arbiter of content. Without further ado, let me hand it over to Ethan to bring you guys in. Thanks, Bargov. appreciate it. Thanks, Marissa and Linux Foundation and all of you all for joining. Like Bargov said, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in. Uh, we will talk about some of the, you know, the topic is use cases for feature flags you may not have thought of. We want to talk a little upfront about kind of what are feature flags and set the expectations a little, make sure they align with what you're thinking about. One of the things I think are uh, kind of interesting, surprising about working with feature flags every day is that a lot of folks know some of the stuff you can do with feature flags uh, and maybe not a bunch of the other stuff you can do. And depending on whatever problem brought you to feature flags initially, the piece of feature flags you know may be a little bit different. If we talk to five people, we'll hear one use case they know, and it might be a different use case for everyone. So starting here with just what are feature flags, right? As Bargov mentioned, you might've heard them called app configs or feature toggles or just toggles. They might be database switches. Some of it might be stuff you've been doing for years and never really thought about, but there's a lot more you can do with that kind of system when you pull it out from kind of bespoke internal logic to an actual service dedicated to it, like Harness Feature Flags. And fundamentally what it's about, right, as you see on the slide here, it's about moving faster by being able to turn stuff on and off without the complexity of a full deployment and rollback cycle. Or another way to say that is decouple your deployment from your release. So I wanna do my deployment, move the code artifact in prod. That doesn't mean I want that feature live the second the deployment's done. I, as the PM, maybe want to turn that feature on for a few specific accounts a few days after the deployment, or if there's an issue, I want to turn the feature off and not have to do an entire rollback. So that's kind of commonly what you would think of as a feature flag. So Ethan, can you share maybe a couple of examples of things in the real world that are controlled by feature flags, right? You, you mentioned there are a bunch of different ways you might see it, a bunch of different ways it's called, but ultimately it sounds like what the end user would see or the end user would interact with tends to be the same, despite the variety of names it may have on the back end. Yeah, I think it's a really good point, right? Feature flags really became sort of famous for some of the work Facebook was doing. About 10 years ago, they got very public with it. Netflix has used it a lot. You can think of a common scenario might be you want to test a feature. You want to see if it's worth investing more in as a V1. You'll hear Facebook does this a lot. So they'll turn it on for 10% of users in maybe Argentina and kind of measure how it does and then maybe test it for 10% of users in a different cohort. And that's where you decide, do we really want to ramp it up for everyone or do we want to move our resources on? You might also see it in terms of uh, a company like Harness or other companies you can give beta features to customers in a much easier way. So a very real world example, right, would be if we want to give you access to something, we turn on the feature flag, you have it on your account. Doesn't mean it's rolled out to everyone, doesn't mean it's rolled out widely in production yet. We can do that at a later point. Yeah, to, to share one of, one of my own examples, when I go on my Amazon app on my phone, if I have it up and my wife has it up, there are a bunch of times when we might see that we're actually getting different versions of the app. 
most recently they made a change to where the menu bar is within the app itself. And so I had it open. And for me, the menu bar was at the top where it used to be. And for my wife, the menu bar was actually at the bottom. And this is, this is a perfect example of what Ethan was describing in terms of companies use this, fun, this, this technology of feature flags all the time to serve up different variations of the product or the application or whatever it is to see how is it that our end users are, are using it and is it achieving what we want to do for them. It could be a business case, a business metric that they're trying to move. A lot of times it's just trying to make things easier to find for users or improving the user experience. So that that's my own, that's my own personal anecdote for how I've seen feature flags used um, towards the end user, right? And to, to Ethan's point, right, it might be called app configs, you know, database switches. You might hear them as feature toggles, feature flags, whatever. But ultimately, if, if you think yourself as the audience about are there scenarios where you've done these things or you want to do these things? Well, those are your common feature flags use cases. And actually, I think that's a perfect segue then into, you know, what are some of those common use cases that we see? Yeah, I think the Amazon example is such a good one, right? When we talk about where we see these commonly used or the things that maybe more people think about, which is the ability to test two versions of an experience. So I'm going to update my navigation. I want to see if that drives more people to the checkout page sooner, right? That's kind of a front end change. You can use a feature flag to do exactly what you just described with Amazon testing conversion or the business outcome. I think it's a very common use case. A lot of folks are aware of usually through the front end. Another fairly common one, like I mentioned, is going to be beta access. So making sure only certain customers get access to a feature before we give it to everyone which kind of goes hand in hand with like testing the readiness of a feature. So I'm going to turn it on a little bit. I'm going to see how it performs for a while and then I'm going to expand it from there or if there are issues, turning it off, right? All of these are scenarios that if you're not familiar with feature flags at all today, highly recommend digging more into them. We've got lots of content. I think Linux Foundation does as well. They're really valuable scenarios. Um, if you're familiar with feature flags or if you have some version of a system that's kind of like feature flags already, there's a good chance this is the context you think of it in, or these are the stories you've heard that feature flags is really good for so far. Looking at this list, it almost sounds like you'd actually try to build this yourself to solve point problems. And at some point without even realizing it, you've ended up with a homegrown feature flag solution. Is, is that right? Or, or maybe the better question is, how do people usually solve for this? Yeah, it's a really good point, right? Um, I think a good analogy as well is maybe like CI 10 or 15 years ago, if anyone was around back then. It usually does start off as you kind of build it yourself to solve a specific challenge, right? A common thing you might see is it gets bolted into like an internal admin portal that's run internally. Uh, you say, oh, we don't really have the tools to turn it on for just specific users, but we can build that for in a couple of days and you build a little UI. And then over time, as you get more and more needs for it, that system gets bigger and bigger and more complex, or you just stop updating it because you really can't support an internal system to do the more complex things people are asking for. Hmm. So that's when you get into migrating off of an internal solution to a commercial feature flag solution like ours or like any of the other great vendors out there on the market doing good work in the space. This is where we were too, right? Before we officially decided to build Harness Feature Flags, we were doing a lot of this in-house, right? Can, can you tell a little bit about our story there? Maybe what caused us to build a full-fledged solution? Yeah, and we've written about this a little bit as well. I think it's a kind of funny meta problem where we had Feature Flags internally, and this is gonna be lowercase Feature Flags, not capital letters, Harness Feature Flags, the product, um, but what we found over time is that as we used feature flags more and more, it was really getting expensive to make our system do these more complex things we wanted. We were having to choose, do we really want to invest engineering resources in our internal system? Um, and then the tools on the market were also getting more mature. So it became a build versus buy decision. This also eventually happened in some other spaces, again, like I mentioned, like CI, where the commercial tooling just began to outpace what you could do with an internal solution. And that's exactly what we found as well. The difference is because we're a software delivery company, we decided we actually had something to offer in terms of building a really top-notch feature flag product, which is what we went ahead and did. 
Yeah, so it it does sound then like it's really common to just you build this without even realizing it. You've you've built an awesome system, and now you might run into the monstrosities of dealing with a homegrown system at scale that maybe wasn't designed for something like that, right? To go across multiple teams to solve complex use cases. Am I following you right? Yeah, exactly. And again, I think these use cases you see up on the screen here, whether you're using an internal system, whether you're using one of the many great vendors out there, right? I don't want to claim we are the only one. There's a lot of people that do good work in this space. Probably the use cases you see on screen are exactly the problems you were aiming to solve when you got into it. Hmm. So, excuse me. So let's get this into a little bit of what we wanted to talk about today, right? Which is if you're starting to solve for those use cases, that's great. Uh, or we get excited is thinking about then what else you can do because there's lots of other really cool things you can do with feature flags once you've kind of done those initial things that provide so much value out of the gate, but bringing it to more teams, more people, that's kind of what we want to talk about for the remainder of the session here today. The yeah, first so use case, about... oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, let's, yeah, let's, let's jump right into it. Yeah, absolutely. So the first use case, right, I mentioned on that previous slide, you saw that front end changes, right? What we find is a lot of people think of feature flags in terms of the user experience exclusively. They don't think of back end things you can do with feature flags. You know, us and all the other people who do this with a feature flag product have what you would call server side SDKs. So Java, .NET, Golang. These are all SDKs you can install in back end code. And they let you do some things you might not be thinking about such as versioning an API or introducing API changes in a pretty slow way or step-by-step -step or with a test audience behind a flag. Uh, tech debt, right? Tech debt is kind of infamously hard to quantify. It's kind of infamously hard to see exactly the payoff. If you put it behind a flag, you have a pretty cool opportunity with tech debt because you can actually run the new version with the refactor against the old version without the refactor and see side by side what's happening to your performance, what's happening to your logging, what's happening to your cost. So tech debt and refactoring is actually a really good opportunity with feature flags that a lot of folks don't think of. And then another one I'll say is migrating infrastructure. Uh, and you can't do all of this with feature flags, right? They're good at, this is a use case by use case thing. What we encourage folks to do is think about is there an opportunity here with feature flags? Some stuff is very uh, artifact heavy or it's really, really bespoke and that's gonna be hard to do in this condition. But I wanna give one example that's a real world example of migrating uh, a logging service, right? Migrating one for the other at a previous job that I worked at. We built a new logging subsystem. We had to get off the old logging subsystem. Normally the way you would do that is with a sort of ops focused backend cutover date, like a midnight release window sort of thing. By using feature flags to control that, what we were able to do is just Monday, 9 a.m., someone would turn that flag on, the new system would get the logs. We'd do that for about an hour and then we'd turn it off. We'd go look through the logs, look at our exceptions, see what we needed to do. The next day, do it again, do it again. If you think about how fast and easy that is with feature flags, just go turn the flag on, turn the flag off. In a previous world, right, that kind of switching over from one system to another is really tough, really expensive. You're talking about deployments and rollbacks and probably ops on call and all kinds of things. Feature flags took all of that away and just made it a very casual task to do a pretty heavy infrastructure migration. Yeah, it's stressful too, right? Like as, as a former dev myself, even though I was on the software engineering side more than ops side, like when you have that cutoff date from ops, like, hey, this is the day we're going live. You need to be ready. Everything needs to be ready. It better work really stressful time as a developer. <laughs> so yeah. I personally I personally liked the ability to be able to say, hey, you know, this is this is like mostly ready. Can we like get it out? And I need a few days to like wrap it up and run some load tests. Uh, and then we can we can you know get this out there fully. Yep, exactly. I think the the peace of mind should not be undervalued in terms of Hard to quantify value, but very, very real value over time. Yeah. And so is this, you know, we were talking a little earlier about like, is this something you could do in-house? Like if you wanted to build this yourself, this seems like something that might be a little on the harder side to do, a little more abstract. Yeah, I think the reason it would be harder to do is kind of the same reason that maybe a lot of folks, even who use feature flags, don't think of these use cases mm -hmm. all the time is when you're thinking about backend stuff and system stuff, 
uh, a lot of times there's kind of either default patterns or ways of working, or we tend to see those as very big expensive things. And we're not going to kind of build glide paths or a lot of like, that, that's why we have these ops periods where we do hard cutovers and things like that, right? So some of it is just kind of the nature of the work makes us disinclined to think about other things we can do like use feature flags. And it's also the case that the people doing this kind of work, right? It's, it's usually a low value uh, use of their time to build an internal feature flag system for these kinds of tasks. It's usually not what you would like those folks doing with their time. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, so let's let's talk about refactoring a little bit because you you just mentioned it too. Yeah, performance refactoring is kind of a a pet one for me because I think it's often talked about. Right, I don't know that anyone has worked anywhere where you're not occasionally trying to deal with how do we make this faster, how do we get the number of queries down, how do we reduce the load. If you've ever gone through that cycle, right, one of the difficult things is knowing exactly how you judge it, how you measure the success, and how you do that in a way that's not super expensive and time consuming. Um, for instance, I've worked at places before where we're really focused on improving uh, our responsiveness of the UI, let's say, but we can really only ever approximate the result because the way the deployments work, right, is like it's kind of an all-in-one switch, and then you don't really get to do an apples-to-apples -apples cohort comparison. So maybe it's a little bit faster, but then also maybe the region's a little bit faster that day. There's a lot of things that can go in. With feature flags, um, I think it's a good practice to use feature flags for all of this type of work by default, because you can always put them side by side. And you can put them side by side, right? Not just once, but in a bunch of different time windows, test it on weekends, test them at night, test them at different load periods, test it at different region, and really get a comprehensive look at what that performance refactoring, whether it's about speed, whether it's about latency, whether it's about simplifying the code on the back end, really give yourself a comprehensive look at what that's doing. This is the example you see there on the slide. We've done this plenty at Harness. I've done this plenty at other jobs as well. The first time you build something, especially a UI, it's probably not going to be the best way you're ever going to build the UI in terms of simplicity or knowing exactly how to design that front and back end communication. So oftentimes what you do is six months later, you say, now that we know what we're doing, we can greatly reduce the amount of calls this front end is making to the back end. Um, but I need to be able to justify that it's worth it. I need to be able to see the impact it's having. Otherwise, it's just kind of invisible tech debt that we can't ever tell if it paid for itself. So feature flags go a long way to solving that problem. Um, they do one of my favorite things, which is always making the implicit explicit. There's an invisible ROI, and now there's a visible ROI. It, it's, as I read this and as I listen to you, it almost sounds like there's a hidden use case in here about potentially even using this to like test new algorithms or testing multiple, multiple ways of trying to make things faster or, or more responsive. Is that part of refactoring or is that, would you classify that differently? No, it definitely could be, right? Because I think a little bit what we're touching on is kind of a mindset as much as it is what specifically the type of work is. Because um, whether you're doing sort of backend or computational things that you want to test the outcome of, like what you just mentioned, um, or a little more what I was talking about, refactoring calls between a front end or a back end, um, you might say, you just said one of the most common use cases was front end, and now you're saying a use case I haven't thought of is front end. So what's the deal there, <laughs> right? But it's because internally, when you say the word feature flag, you would probably say, oh, no, this doesn't need a feature flag because I'm not going to roll this out to beta customers. This mm -hmm. isn't the kind of thing that is about a feature release, so I don't use a feature flag for that. This is about thinking of the feature flag a little bit differently and more of a change management tool and really is more of a quality mm -hmm. gate and an assessment tool. Interesting. Okay. I, I, I do want to remind the audience real quick in case anyone did have any questions, we are trying to keep this conversational. So don't be shy about asking questions in case they do pop up. Of course, at the end, we will have dedicated time for Q&A. Just wanted to give a quick reminder in case you do have questions as we go through this content, feel free to drop it and we will address it as soon as we see it. All right, watch. Now no questions will come in and I will have made a fool of myself. All righty then. Let's talk about ops toggles. Yeah, ops toggles is a uh, another really interesting one, right? Because any ops team 
I've ever been close to. They've got a big set of run books and playbooks and incident response uh, practices. They sort of know what systems to tweak over time. If you're running a SaaS application, you know what systems might have load issues, you have ways to deal with them. The unfortunate truth more often than we might want to admit is that the way ops work is done is a little bit brute force surgery. So it involves getting into the cloud console directly, sometimes running queries. We're not gonna say anyone ever uh, might even connect to a database in production directly. Um, if you have a security team, no one's definitely doing that, but I've worked at places where that happens. Um, so the problem with this, right, is ops work, incident resolution work, this kind of work, it tends to be very hard to audit over time. It's great when it happens, you got the incident closed, but where do you have a record of that? Where do you have the record of who made the changes, who ran the playbook? Or what if the people who are the best at it are on vacation and now you've got somebody who's never done it trying to execute a run book or some kind of incident response playbook that they in theory understand, but they've never done it before mm -hmm. and they're connected to the AWS console and there's a lot of risk in that, right? Um, and then do you really wanna be pulling down cloud logs and various things anytime you wanna have an audit or review what happened? So what we find is a lot of these systems you can put behind a feature flag, because I mentioned you can use backend flags, you can use server side flags, you can flag APIs, you can do all that kind of stuff. So for instance, if you know that a system tends to be a risk at high load, a real world example I've seen is like a caching backup system that sometimes during really peak load would start to back up tasks and that could spill over to other scheduling systems. Um, so what the ops team would do is they'd keep track and if anyone got paged on that system, they had a series of commands they could go in that they'd turn the caching system off, they'd do it manually, and then later on, they would turn it back on and then they'd write up a little incident response issue. Eventually, a real place I worked where we did that, right? we moved that to behind a feature flag. And that was a really huge relief because nobody had to run commands. There was no terminals involved. We had a flag to turn off the caching system. It was fully audited. This was using an internal system. This is several years ago. The commercial tooling wasn't quite as strong back then. But even with an internal system, it was night and day, um, especially when ops was maybe on vacation or not available. And any engineer knows if I go click that flag, the caching system is going to turn off. Right, that's not as scary as shelling into AWS to run some commands you've never run before. So I think it's a really, really powerful use case for folks to think of. Um, and the reason it doesn't come up, I'll say, people always think about feature flags in terms of new work. We're starting a new feature, we're making a change, put it behind a flag. Here, what we're talking about is a little different. We're saying, go take stuff you're already doing. Go take stuff that exists in your Confluence and your wikis and your Jira's and all these places. Think about putting that stuff behind a flag that's already there. This is about retroactively adding flags, not putting new stuff behind flags. So I think it doesn't come up as much for that reason as well. Is this, how, how would you say this might impact the life of say an ops person or someone on the development side? I, I know you said a little bit about, you know, there's, uh, if, if someone, if there's a playbook and rather than going through, you know, the 20 steps through AWS, but if we could summarize that or like sum it up, like, how do you think this would impact uh, even qualitatively just the lives of, of ops and dev teams? Yeah, I, I will say as somebody who has in a past life had to make some very last second, it's an inopportune time of the year, the right people are not available. Um, I can page people, but do I really want to page someone who's on vacation in late December? I think I can give this a shot myself. I see the instructions, but it is not fun or easy to press enter in a terminal window on something you're not 100% sure of and your only reference point is a document somebody else wrote, right? That is a terrifying thing, but it's equally bad to have to page people. It's equally bad to have to bring people in from their PTO. So that that's like a lot of stress. It's a lot of interruption. It's a lot of distraction. Um, and it's also hours and hours back. The time it takes to do interacting with your cloud systems directly uh, can be very cumbersome. The time it takes to pull the data after if you want an audit record of who made those changes to give to your security and compliance folks can take a whole lot of time. Feature flag, one click, it's done. So we're talking about both the time savings and then also just a morale, a stress savings there. Yeah, talk about having an easy button for, for ops problems. So 
Obstacles are interesting. You know, I can also actually see almost a, a branding play in some ways too. The first example that pops into my mind is if you go to google.com and you don't have an internet connection, it will take you to the, the offline dinosaur jumping game. <laughs> and I, I can totally see ops teams or marketing teams too wanting to say like, hey, if something's wrong, let's make it clear it's not our fault. And let's let's give them something alternative or, or something fun to latch on to, to associate with, with the brand. Is, is that something that you have seen or you think could work? 100%. So in the real world example I just gave at the previous place I worked, we had to turn off the caching system. We didn't do this, but what you just said makes me think I wish we had been smarter back then and had done this. And there's no reason that the same flag that turned off the caching system for ops purposes couldn't also be turning on an in-app message that says, hey, we're experiencing peak load please give your logs a little more time to cache. They'll be available later today. That could have been fully automated. Doing that kind of experience without a flag is at least a two-step process, probably a much longer process where multiple people have to get involved. Uh, now I'm sitting here thinking, why didn't we do that? I wish we had thought about that, but that is a great idea that you can kind of couple the backend side of it with the front end or the user impact you want to correspond. Yeah, just hearing you talk about it makes me feel less stressed, honestly. Taking the work of a war room or pager or like, you know, someone who's on pager duty and basically saying, you know, don't worry about that so much. Just hit the button. That's it. Worry about it in the morning. Yep, exactly. Um, exactly. I, I do have a, a, a question that, that came into chat here, Ethan, as we were talking. Let me read it to you. <laughs> I can imagine that over time, we will accumulate feature flags to the point that it can be a nightmare to maintain. What are best practices with regards to managing feature flags? For example, we need to regularly delete feature flags corresponding to features that are already on in all environments. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Anyone who has ever dealt with feature flags at scale has definitely encountered that. So that I don't know if the person asking the question has hands-on experience or was speculating, but it's, it's, it's right on the money. Um, it's a very difficult problem. I would say I think it's a problem all of us who have tools in the market are working to get better at solving in a product sense. And there's two sides of it, right? There's process and product. I think for us building products, we want to make the products better at doing that. Don't necessarily want to dwell on that here. On the process side, what we do encourage the team is to think about feature flags as part of your engineering process, right? The same way that if you have an incident, you're gonna write an incident uh, you know, response or some sort of message out to the team and to the company. The same way you might do post-mortems at the end of a sprint. It's important to think of feature flags. They are part of your engineering process. They're not some kind of thing that you just throw out there, you use them and it's done. Um, some of them maybe you want to live for a very long time like these ops toggles but you wanna separate those from the ones that you do wanna get out of the system, like a feature that's been fully activated. So I would think about where they can live in your planning and cleanup process. Is there a tech debt window you can fit them into? Can you assign owners? Can you keep track of them over time? Can you make them part of your release process? So for instance, you don't close the Epic for a new feature that's been launched until the flag is out of the system. Maybe you start every new initiative with the remove feature flag story added to JIRA or wherever and it's the last story in every epic. So there's not kind of one silver bullet answer. It's a mixture of what the products need to help you do, as well as your team practices and hygiene. But again, coming back to what I said earlier a little bit too, that we're talking a bit about a mindset, it's really helpful to think of feature flags as a way of working, not just a way to change the UI, not just kind of a tool that helps you release, but it's really a way your team can work by default, right? It's a new way to work with a new type of change management mentality that does involve some new process such as cleanup as well. Hmm. I do want to I do want to thank our attendee for asking a question and not making me fall on my face asking you to ask questions live. So I appreciate that. Uh, I, I do want to add too that you're not alone in this problem. Uh, when we talk to customers, when we just generally talk to the market, we find that this idea of how do we manage things when they scale up really heavily, like how do we do lifecycle management of flags essentially, is really a growing, a really growing and significant pain point that everyone doing feature flags is trying to figure out right now. 
And so in addition to adding those, the, the processes that, that Ethan suggested, you know, you can probably expect in the near future that if you are looking at tools, tools will be looking to solve this issue for you in the near future too. Very, very common you know, thing here. Absolutely. And on that point, if you have ideas for how you think tools should be helping you, we would love to hear from you. So don't ever hesitate to reach out. I think it's, like Bargov said, it's a pretty hot topic right now in the whole space. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you from my own personal experience, Ethan is awesome at listening and and you know building really good solutions. So if you have if you have ideas, Ethan will definitely listen. Just you know, shout out to my own coworker here. All right, uh, let's move it. let's move along here, Ethan. Let's talk about compliance. Yeah, so compliance is another. I, I feel like I'm saying they're all pretty cool ones, but I think compliance is a pretty cool <laughs> one. Um, Right, so you might have uh, some real examples again, like there are logistics companies that deal with certain types of, you could say freight, or maybe they're doing government services. If you're in the US, those can vary quite a bit state by state, right? Tax policy or how you weigh and measure things for cost or what do you need to report out to the end user? That can be tremendously different state by state here, certainly different country by country. Maybe there's things you don't want to give to government customers if you have federal contracts, but it's fine for consumers. Maybe there's things you might want to show that you don't want to show in EU with different regulations. So the normal way to do those kinds of things, there's a couple of ways it'll be done, right? One is pretty hefty conditional stuff in your code where your code is doing a lot of real heavy custom bespoke lifting to know what to do and not do, or you build these really aggressive abstractions in the product um, another way to do it is actually just to run different versions of your applications. That can be even worse and even more expensive. Um, feature flags are really great because you could just have one canonical version of your app and you can turn stuff on and off against any of these things you need. So if you're running in our government cluster, we might turn off a certain data feature. If you're running in one of our uh, EU targets, we might turn off a certain data feature. Or we might say, hey, Texas calculates shipping costs very different. If we're in a trucking product space. So for any of our customers in Texas, we're gonna serve a different flag state than the ones in Ohio. So feature flags is a really, really simple way to bring all of that out of your application. Don't run different things in parallel. Don't build this complex web of abstracted logic to figure this out. Just use feature flags. And then you've got a UI, you've got auditing, you've got governance, you've got visibility, and it can be changed very, very quickly. So this is one that I think companies, especially in these regulated spaces or that are serving federal or that are in really complex spaces where things are regionally different, I would take a really hard look at how much kind of maybe invisible cost is in your code that could be moved to feature flags and would make a whole lot of things a lot easier. Mm. Yeah, one simple example I could think of that is, is you're mentioning EU, like GDPR. You know, there, there may be data collection practices that you can do uh, here in the United States, but if anyone's in Europe, you turn on your GDPR flag, you're not collecting it. With the new CCPA that passed, uh, I think last year was it, maybe two years ago, I must be getting old. This is very similar, right? Having a flag to show like, do I opt in, do I opt out? Or can I just serve them a default experience? These are these are actually really common problems that that I see companies facing, especially from a compliance side. Yeah, and another good one to think about is if anyone here builds both a SaaS and on-prem version of your product. Yeah, great right? This is another one where making something that doesn't work in the on-prem version not be in the on-prem version can typically be sort of expensive, <laughs> multiple release trains, stuff in the code saying, hey, this is on-prem, turn this off, use this different networking logic if it's on-prem, right? That's really, really not a fun thing to do, to ship a SaaS product on-prem if there are differences. Feature flags make it a very, very trivial thing to do. If you put that behind the flag, you target your on-prem, you turn it off with the flag, something that can legitimately take dozens or hundreds of hours to figure out maintain over time really becomes a process of a couple hours, um, maybe even less as you get good at it and mature over time. Yeah, great. Thank you for sharing that. All right, we have one more use case free trials and th this is one i'm excited to hear about because this is something that we do internally at harness i think ethan gave an example earlier of how we're so we're a software delivery platform we have multiple products 
And if you're on a free trial for a certain product, if you sign up for say harness continuous integration or continuous delivery or feature flags, all we do is we set an entitlement on the back end. And depending on what you signed up for, we flip a flag, make you one of the people that's supposed to get that product. And suddenly you have that available as your free trial. I, I hope I'm representing that well, Ethan. Yeah, exactly. I think anybody who's ever had to build this stuff, right, is one of the least pleasant things to build because it takes a lot of time. There's a lot of corner cases um, and it is not core. It's core to what you need to do as a business, but it's not core to the value your product is providing at the end of the day. So this is something feature flags make so easy. And again, it's, it's thinking about flags a little different. Because if you're thinking about beta use cases or adding beta users, that's still a flag that's eventually going to be removed from the system once the beta is over. This is more thinking of flags as a permanent way to kind of control your free tier, at least control the elements in the UI maybe that need to be switched on or off depending on the plan. It's not going to solve everything you need to do for entitlements, right? Because there's still some building reconciliation stuff. But there is a really strong use case of just saying, hey, once you handle the billing side, just turn the flag on or turn the flag off based on the plan. Or if I'm a free user, just give me an access to a subset of features. It can really be, if you think of it one way, a way to turn your entire UX into sort of a configurable atomic system that you can wow. turn on and off based on different conditions. So how many flags do we have in our system today? Oh, at Harness? Yeah. Oh, you know, it changes. It changes very, very quickly, but several hundred in any given week is probably the average and every team kind of does it themselves what they need for their product here. The, the other thing I would note, right, is that the flags are not just for engineers. The flags are not just for me as PM. Our accounts and support teams at Harness use flags uh, because we make it very easy for them to use. Doesn't require technical skills to change the flag once you've wired it up to the account experience. So if you're my customer, I'm a support rep, I can say, oh, you want to try this new feature or you want to try upgrading to a higher tier. Cool, I flip the flag, you have it. I don't have a whole bunch of complex backend stuff I have to do. We don't have to maintain a really heavy internal system to do that. We can kind of give that power to everyone in the org and we do here at Harness. And we have gotten rid of a ton of uh, admin portal code that used to exist by migrating this all over the feature flags over time. Hmm. Yeah, and to, to build on that, that piece of it, really allowing account teams to be involved. Imagine for all the developers on the call here, imagine a world in which an, an account rep says, hey, I need to extend a trial or I need this feature turned on in my product. Imagine that you as a developer didn't need to be involved in that anymore. Make database changes, you know, check a bunch of config files to make sure that all the right stuff is being turned on, nothing is wonky. Just being able to say like, oh, you need to do it? Well, we have our feature flag system, just change their 14 day trial to a 30 day trial, you know, turn on this feature and you have the control to do that now for your accounts. Uh, it <laughs> saves days um, of, of headaches sometimes in my experience. Like, it's not something that's always easy to do. It, it also saves the rather unpleasant feeling of being a PM or an account rep or a support rep and knowing you're interrupting some poor engineer who's trying to get their work done, <laughs> saying, hey, I know, I'm sorry, but can you please stop what you're doing and go turn this on over here for me? And then five minutes later, oh, wait, it didn't work. Can you check again? Right, that doesn't feel good for anyone involved. So it's also a way to just sidestep that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost similar to that, that operational runbook in a way, right? That with a single flag, suddenly you're, you're controlling like a series of basically you're basically triggering a waterfall of events that needs to happen in order to make it work. And it's just, you, you just hit the easy button and it's done. Yep. And again, it comes back to that kind of change in how you may see feature flags today, which is going from, oh, it's a way to, to introduce a new feature. Oh, it's a way to introduce a button, change a button, change a color to, it's kind of a really, it's really a way of working, right? All of our changes go about behind flags. Different people are going to control those flags. Some of those flags live for a long time. Some of them get removed in a very short time. Some of them are about giving them to customers. Some of them are just so we can learn the impact. So it's the full spectrum usage. But if your change is behind a flag, you have so much optionality on all those dimensions that you just won't have without flags. Awesome. 
So for the audience here, that does bring us to the end of our five core use cases. If you do want to learn more about other sorts of use cases, how you might be able to use flags for these common use cases as kill switches for ops toggles. We do have a QR code on the screen here with the little Google dinosaur that I happen to refer to. I promise I didn't remember the dinosaur was in the QR code. Um, feel free to scan that and that will take you to a blog written by Ethan himself um, that talks a little bit more about kill switches and some of these other sorts of use cases you might be interested in. With that, let me open up to anyone that may have additional questions on the webinar here. I'll give you guys a few seconds to start putting those together. And we already have someone with a question. The first question I have for you, Ethan, when is the free and team tier of feature flags for Harness available? I love this question. Someone already went to our website, they looked at our pricing, and they want to start using it. Thank you. I yep. pre appreciate uh, you, you checking us out. Yep, absolutely appreciate it. Uh, Harness, we do have a free tier. So you can go in there today, sign up, and start using it. Today, it's a free trial, so it is time limited. In January, that's going to switch to an unlimited uh, long-term free tier. So forever free tier at certain levels of usage. Since we're almost at January, if you sign up now, you might just be able to overlap to where your trial ends and the free tier has shipped. I think we're pretty close. Yeah, and I do want to be clear that the the difference between that that free trial and the free forever plan, there, there is a difference. One gives you access to all the features for a set amount of time. The other one, you can use feature flags for anything uh, forever. You know, obviously there are limits. We, we are a business. Um, but do, I just do want to be clear that you will be able to use Harness feature flags free forever uh, once that's live shortly. Okay, uh, another question for you, Ethan. This one is from George. I somehow missed one. I'm assuming this is one of these cases. Uh, George got performance refactoring, ops toggles, compliance, and free trials. Maybe let me just zoom back. APIs and backends. Yeah, there you go. Yep. So this is really about the idea that there are server SDKs and you can use feature flags to control parts of your system, parts of your infrastructure, not just the user experience or the things customers interact with. So I won't necessarily repeat um, everything we covered, but it's really about thinking about system migration and other types of backend work. It's also heavily covered in those blogs that Vargov link to on those slides. So if you want more details on that, I would recommend reading those. Okay, I hope that helps, George. I see a, another question that came in. What are the best use cases to start with? It sounds like this might be a question about these, um, these, these use cases we've talked about today. It could also be a question about even the common use cases and where we should start. Not entirely sure. Yeah, so I, I really like this question and we get asked it a lot and my answer, um, I don't want to seem evasive, um, but one <laughs> of the things sometimes stops people from adopting feature flags is they're asking this question, what is the right use case to start? And there's always the kind of like, oh, we can't really think of a perfect use case right now. We'll ask around, maybe another team has a good use case. So what I like to say is the right place to start is just put a flag around whatever you're working on right now. You may not know exactly what you're gonna do with the flag. You may not know exactly why you want the flag, but if you're building a new feature, if you're making some kind of change, just go ahead and put it behind a flag. And when you get to the end of the development process for that feature or that change, you may say, oh, this is great that we have a flag. We can test it out. We didn't intend to, but it's there. We have the option. Or you might say, we don't need to. Chances are, if you have the flag, if you have the option, you're gonna say, let's test it a little bit first. We can do this now, we couldn't before. So again, what I would say is there may not be one perfect starting point. Very oftentimes kind of simple UI changes are the easiest to get your head around. But if you're making changes to your code, you've got an opportunity to go add a flag and then just figure out later exactly how you wanna use it instead of trying to wait for the perfect opportunity. Yeah, with, with so many different ways to use flags, it's it's really a greenfield opportunity to just start trying stuff, in my opinion. 
Um, you know, not that you wanted my opinion. You probably wanted Ethan's. <laughs> all right. Uh, another question. Thank you, audience. You guys, you, you all are really engaged. Really appreciate these, these questions coming in. Are there concerns about security or customer data with feature flags? This is a good one. Uh, the answer in short is it's really uh, good to ask that question. Um, it's always good to ask that question. So be mindful. I would say broadly across what we built at Harness, as well as the other vendors with tools in this space, I think the answer is probably no. So I think everyone in the space is a pretty good player in terms of security and privacy. You install SDKs in your app to use feature flags, the Harness SDK, most of the other ones, they're open source. You can always audit them. Your security teams can take a look and we don't collect any data by default. You have to send us data and we're working on some stuff as well that you can even obscure what you send us. Um, but I think generally it's the right question to ask. Um, the space overall, I think, has done a good job of taking that question seriously and making it in a way that you're not going to find much privacy or data risk once you dig in. Yeah, awesome. That's that's huge, especially when we start thinking about all of the new data privacy and security laws being passed around the world, making sure that it's easy to stay in compliance no matter where you are. Yep. Cool. And then one more question here for you, Ethan. How can I get more people at my company to use flags? Yeah, that's another question we hear a lot. It's a great question, um, particularly if you are using flags and it's exciting, it's making a difference and you just want everyone to start using them because now you're seeing everything that could be possible if more of your company would do it. Um, this is another one where there's probably no silver bullet answer. The more you're using flags, first of all, the better. So going back to what I was saying about not waiting for the perfect opportunity, um, if you can go to other people in your company with case studies, if you can go show the company kind of the art of the possible, what you've done on your team that they can't do on their team, and if you can start to show the leadership the cost of that, right? Here's a change that we turned off in five seconds with a flag instead of 25 minutes with a rollback. Here's the refactor that we were able to test and find out that it's five times faster and we wouldn't know how much faster it was if we couldn't run it side by side in the feature flag, right? Collecting those data points to really start to make it seem like, of course, you're going to use it. It would be a bad financial and economic and output decision not to use flags. But sometimes you have to do a little work to quantify it. The other thing you can do a little work on is maybe just showing people how easy it is. Because it's, uh, there, there can be a starting or a momentum issue, right? Once you get going, it's easy, but getting going can be hard. So you can sort of be an advocate for, we did it. It took this amount of time. We had a flag working with a couple hours and sort of be that leader and putting that picture out to the rest of the company. Awesome. Thank you for fielding all those questions, Ethan. That does bring us to the end of our time with everyone today. Let me hand it back over to Marisa and the Linux Foundation. Just want to thank everyone again for joining us today. Hopefully this was an informative and eventful session for all of you. Uh, back to you, Marisa. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ethan and Bargov. That was wonderful. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Just as a quick reminder, this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. Oh, we hope you guys will join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.